if there, if someone is listening and they're like, you know what, I am, I'm mourning that I can't drink, or I think I do uh, need help. It is that support system that is crucial to get into a support system that other people have gone before you and they know how to come alongside you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Rooted in Christ podcast. My name is Eric Stevens. I'm the founder of Redwood Christian Ministries. Hope everyone out there is doing well today. With me on the show, this guest is long overdue. Coach, boundary coach, Megan DeVito. How are you doing, sister? Eric, I am doing well. It's an honor and privilege and God's timing is always perfect, right? So there was a delay in us being uh, here, getting together, and I'm just so grateful for this time. So thank you. Well, I'm looking forward to everything that you're getting ready to share. Thank you for being, thank you for being here again. I'm just going to dive right into it. So tell the audience a little bit more about yourself, just about your, your testimony, how you, how you came to know the Lord, and then just maybe some of the things you're doing for, for Christ today. Yeah. Wow. So good. Okay. So I'm going to be conscientious of of your time and and your audience's time. But so my name is obviously Megan and I live at the coast of uh, the Jersey Shore uh, with my husband and my two kids. And I say I'm parenting um, with Grace. I have a 15 year old and a 17 year old. So teen ages, right? So I, my testimony, I, I didn't grow up knowing the Lord. I grew up in a religious, I couldn't even say it's religious. I just grew up in a Catholic household and there's nothing wrong with Catholicism, but it was something that I've always just feared the love the Lord. It was always just, I didn't have a relationship with my loving father like I do today. So getting into it, I could start. And if you have questions, Eric, I, I just would love for you to um, just interrupt me. But my you know, I go, I always go back to the age of 15. Not that I want to go back there, but that's where really the, the turning point of the start of the dysfunction in my life started. And at 15, I, I started drinking. I was a early age alcoholic, full thrown alcoholic at the age of 15, 16, 17. And I can't say I blame anybody for that, right? But I grew up in a household where there was no boundaries. No one knew what boundaries were. And I had two parents that were very hurt people raising children, right? So there was a lot of uh, generational cycles that were never broken and, and trauma that they didn't take care of. And I'm not saying I'm a victim. I, 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 my, my experience is now for me to give experience, my experiences for to give strength and hope to others today. But it was a it was a really messy season. And I didn't really know how messy it was until I started, I became sober in recovery. So, so did your at that because you said at age 15. So like, were your parents kind of aware of, of the what was going on? Or were they aware of that downward spiral when it started? Well, they were part of it. I mean, I was a drinking buddy to my father. And I have a I have a twin brother I don't have contact with, but you know, my, my mother was addicted to pain pills and, and then he got addicted. So it was a very self-medicated, self-medicated household. We drank when we were sad, we drank when to celebrate, we self-medicated and I didn't know any other way. I remember if I had a headache, I was taking narcotics before school. It was just because it was available, right? So I remember popping some pills in my pocket and taking them at the lunch table. And someone's like, that's wrong. And I'm like, no, you're wrong. Like, mind your own business. Like, but that's how I, I grew up. So when I did decide, when God actually placed me in rehab at the age of 20, to answer your question, my father said, I... I always knew you had a problem. And that's the thing it was, it, I, they always knew I had a drinking problem, but um, it was never addressed because they had their own issues. Right. Mm -hmm. So you said you got placed in rehab at age, age 25. So yeah. how did that work? How did God work, you know, navigate that, that season of, of your life? Yeah. So good. So um, I became, I woke up in a blackout in the streets of Philadelphia at the age of 25. And God was so good to me. I was sitting just to kind of recap where I was the night I woke, I came to, I was sitting in my car and I had the keys in the ignition and there was a truck driver in the parking lot. I must have pulled over. I, I, I'm i sorry to admit, but I was blackout drunk and, and driving and, and, and I'm not proud to say it. It was just where I was. And there was a tractor trailer in the parking lot of the Kmart that I was parked in. And the tra the driver was trying to get me in his cab. 
And I came to going, I know I didn't want to get in his cab because I would have been hurt. So he said, the cab driver said to me, if you don't get in my cab, I'm calling the police. So he threatened me to call the police. And I said, go ahead. Somehow, some ways, I don't know how I knew to take my keys out of the ignition. So I wasn't driving. Police came, they picked me up, they took me home. I randomly got a neighbor that I never met before. I'm in the suburbs of Philadelphia, not really on the outskirts of the city. I went to their door and I said, listen, my car is down the street and I got stuff in it and I'll share it with you if you go get my car. So he, they brought me to my car, finished whatever it, there was in there. And I woke up the next morning and I was like, God, I cannot do this anymore. I was at an early age. I had a career and I had, I was moving. I thought I was moving through the ranks of corporate America. And I remember putting my business suit on at that day. And it was a hot summer day in in July. And I was just sweating it out, Eric. And I just knew I, I couldn't do it anymore. And it wasn't my strength that said, get to rehab. It, it was, it was the Lord. And I started seeing him working in my life for the first time. So this was, was this, was this a park line in Jersey or a park line in Philly? I'm sorry. Park line in Philly. God was uh-huh. definitely, yeah, God was definitely with you. <laughs> he was so with oh, me. My goodness. He was so, I didn't, I didn't get arrested. I didn't right. get harmed. I didn't get hurt, uh, like assaulted. He just p- picked me up out of my car and I didn't kill anybody. Thank God. So it just picked me up. And then I, and then I started the sobriety um, journey and recovery. And that was messy because I wanted to get better. And now I'm dealing with a family that doesn't know how to get better. Right. So there was a season of a season of that where, you know what, it was the first time in my life that I had to put myself first. And looking back on this and all the work that I've been doing, I'm 44 years old, all the work that I've been doing on myself for the last so many years, especially in sobriety, I recognize that I drank at such an early age to be emotionally numb of other people's pain because I couldn't fix them. Now I'm dealing with people. I was in a, a home where they didn't know the Lord and I didn't know the Lord. So we had no rescue, right? The only rescue we had was substance. So now I'm trying to get better at the age of 25, right? And God stepped in tremendously at that time. You said something so good there because you can't take someone to a place you've never been to, right? Like we, we can't lead from, from that position. So it, the awareness that you had at that point of how am I, I'm in a house right now where they have their own issues they have their problems. Okay. I may have to do this. It is going to be myself and it's going to be God. And if, if it's not going to be through with and through him living for him and living from him, this just is not going to, to work because the people around me have never seen this side of the journey. They've never seen this side of the road. And, and I was living on my own in my own apartment and my family was at distance, but I was still emotionally enmeshed and so attached. It it might as well have been, we were living under the same household. My twin at that time, he was in and out of rehab. So they, I like, they tasted, they, they could have had it and they just chose. And I believe that like they could have had it. It's just, they chose not to, and that's nobody like, I'm not blaming anybody. Right. So but what you said, you what you hit the nail on the head, when I came out of um, rehab and I, I came home to my apartment, my mother came down to visit me and she had, she had beer hidden in her suitcase. Now I'm trying to stay sober. I'm holding on to it. Like I like life, is, this is life or death for me. But like you said, like she didn't know what it was like to have it. So she couldn't help me. Yeah. So how much... And I'm curious, I had to do this for myself too. How much did your circle, your inner circle actually oh. change at that point? And then how much did it it grow into to something completely different at that point as well? Such a great question. So my inner circle, um, yeah, at 25, it's hard uh, making new friends, right? I mean, all pe- people, places and things. I It's just, it was painful, but I had to start stepping away from the relationships I had because they were so toxic, even in my friendships, right? But then what was so, what was so hard in the pruning season that God was putting me through was that after two years of sobriety, I had to cut ties with my parents and my twin. 
And I had it, I had to not cut ties because it was only my sobriety. Now I had a newborn baby and I had a husband and I could not let that dysfunction in anymore because it was not, it wasn't just life or death for me, that dysfunction. Now I'm protecting my family that God has given me. And I I ask people this sometimes too, was there was that moment in rehab for you or was that moment where it said, you know what, Jesus, my life is yours. Like, do you remember the day where you said, I'm shutting the door to this God, I'm, I'm your daughter. My life is in your hands. You have my, yes, you have my surrender. Like, do you, was it a specific moment for you or was it just over this, this period of time? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to the point where I did surrender to the Lord and that was probably a good 10, 11 years into my sobriety. So I wasn't there yet. I was just that I was just hurt, beat up. And I knew, you see, God, it was so good because I knew what sobriety was. I knew I had God in my life. I didn't have, but I always felt um, guilty, remorseful and shame. So like, I wasn't, I wasn't, available to have a relationship with him because I didn't feel worthy enough because of the addiction, right? Now, on top of that, growing up in a Catholic household, right? You honor your mother and father. You just do whatever they say. So now I have to separate myself from my birth parents. The only parents I have are are no. We're so enmeshed and I have to break that separation. So now I feel like I'm sinning even more, but I was surviving, right? but I was surviving without the Lord. But the only thing that I did have was I had recovery and I had the room uh, support rooms. And I encourage people who are struggling to get into a 12 step program. Now, now my recovery is Jesus. But if you, if you're early in that sobriety, that, that community, right. My, my circle changed dramatically because I was in a, in a support system there with the recovery process. Because I've I've battled addiction. Well, I battled addiction for a good portion of of my walk too. Like just I mean my life in general. And so for me, I had to not only did I have to change my my inner circle, but then I had to completely change the heart condition too. It was yeah. like that's where for me, like you can get delivered from something and set free from something. But if I didn't putting the word of God behind that was so critical for me so I could yeah. understand the the spirits that I was actually fighting and and battling against because it is one thing to just stop a behavior it is something completely different than to then change the heart condition and thought process behind said behavior yeah. and it's and what we expose ourselves to on those day-to-day minute by minute basis it may not feel like in a moment but sometimes those things just start to chip away at your armor and we have to take yeah. a hard look at ourselves especially when you speaking for myself when I knew I had a weakness with alcohol yeah. In, in in my situation, God was so patient with me. He just, wait, he was so, and he has been, he always is, but he has been so patient to give me the time that I needed to come to him. Because it, like I said, it was, I, the support rooms really became my church. I didn't have a church right in the beginning. Then God gave me sobriety and a family and 10 years down the road, Eric, I, we started going to a Bible based church. I was probably in my thirties before I've ever really opened a Bible, Mm. right? I didn't know. I was afraid of it. I was intimidated by it. Like I, I grew up reciting prayers. And if I didn't know the prayer, I would, was punished because I was tested on it. It was grades, right? So there was a lot of stuff that I had, but God knew I wasn't ready to walk into this full fed relationship on my terms because there was so much healing that I had to do. There was so much awareness. There was so much... So when I did open up and I'll never forget the day where I, I, I remember going to a Bible-based church and I, I stood, I walked into that church for the first time. And I said to my husband, I'm going to go check it out because we, I went down, is, this is funny how God is. He brought me down to Texas for business and I, and we live in New Jersey and I came back from Texas and I said, I don't know what they're doing down there. I said, but they pray and they have Jesus. And whatever they have, we need in our marriage. And he's like, oh my gosh, you go for a weekend, you go away and you come back like change person. I go, I don't know what it is, right? Because we live in the brutal no- Northeast. And right. I, I was, I went to a Bible-based church and I walked into that church and I, 
heard for the first time. And I just sat there and I bawled and I cried and I was like, I'm home. But God was still preparing me and working on me. And the next week, my husband came and he was like, wow, I feel so welcomed here. I feel so wanted. So we started attending a a Bible-based church and we started getting involved in service. Eric, let me just tell you, I wanted the relationship with God. I And I'm not a jealous person, but I was envious of people who had a relationship with the Lord because I didn't. And I had this black block in my heart. It was me. I had this. And I kept saying, I don't know why I can't feel it. Like, I don't know why I can't listen to sermons, worshiping, praying, all this stuff. And then I went to church one day and we had a new youth pastor come up. And you know how when like the the youth pastor comes up to the sermon on serv- on Sunday service, everyone's like, oh, it's like not the head pastor. So I do this like eye roll and I was like, oh, it's this new guy. And pastor, and I love him and we're good friends today. And pastor Keith came on that stage and he said something. I don't know what he said verbatimly. He said something that spoke to my heart. I went home. I went for a walk with the dog. And I looked up to the sky and I said, Lord, you've been here. The I get emotional. You've been here the whole time. It was me that wasn't showing up. And that was it. That That's when the floodgates opened. And I was like, I was ready to receive them. And all that stuff, all of the years. The, and, and then God said to me, I'm your heavenly father. You can't look to me like you look to your earthly father. That's so good. Right? So it was all of this. So here I am now. And and all of that hurt and stuff. And it's just start. I started a new recovery process. A recovery process that was so sweet that I never ever experienced before. Sorry, I get emotional sometimes when <laughs> No, those are those are good. That's those are good tears. Those, yeah. are, those are the good tears. And I I think about some of the things that God has has saved and spared me from just from from my past and my my background. The I've I've talked about this in this podcast before, but the book Ask It by Andy Stanley, where he always talks about what is the wise thing to do. So based off your, your past experiences, your current circumstances and your future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing for you to do? And when I read that book for me, it was like, it helped open my eyes to the root cause of some of my, my weaknesses where, yeah, I had an addiction with, with alcohol, but the root cause of the problem was really rejection. But knowing that I still have a weakness here, I'm not going to go hang out in this bar or I'm not going to go watch this this MMA or UFC pay-per-view in this bar. I'm going to start doing these things in my house. I'm going to start hanging out with like-minded people who have that relationship with God that I'm that I'm yearning for because I I can empathize what you you kind of said. I'm like, man, I see this individual over here and they got their hands up and they're crying and they're worshiping. I'm standing here arms folded. I'm I'm singing, I'm trying to rock back and forth it's like what what is what is going what is going on here because I grew up going to a Catholic school and a Baptist church. So I had mass on Friday, Baptist church on Sunday. <laughs> so I had a little <laughs> bit of confession on thir- uh, on Friday morning. I mean, like Yeah, yeah. Or in my case Monday too. It was just wild. Yeah. And so and I when I got to college, I literally I walked away from it because I said I'm I want to go experience what the world yeah. has. Because and I mean more than just staying up and sit down and hymnals and all of these things, yeah. you know. I got baptized at age 12, but that was the understanding of a 12 year old boy, because then I would even argue that 18 through 25, I was still acting like a boy. So, so I, I hear you, but I, those are, those are definitely tears of, of joy. And we, I, I, we thank God for those moments. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And with that, there's, there's been a lot of understanding and, and I guess there's been forgiveness. I don't hold on to this bitterness with my family. It's just because I just, they just don't know any better, but also to John 15, five, like the branches, like where is the branches producing the fruit? Right. And like, they're not branches that are going to produce any fruit for me, for my children and the legacy of my family. So unfortunately that door is closed. I don't know what God's going to do in the future with that, but I had a, I had a heal from that, but it's that, that also that forgiveness piece that you can forgive people from a distance and also pray for them. Forgiveness doesn't mean that we forget. Yeah. Forgiveness sets both parties free. 
yeah. the one who was offended and the one who did the offending. And forgiveness kind of for it can be a number of different reasons for why forgiveness needs to take place. I just I just picked that one. But forgiveness also means the relationship, just because I forgive you, that doesn't mean the relationship is ever going to be the same again. I'm going to make sure I forgive. So there's not, so it doesn't give the enemy a foothold in my life. So it doesn't hinder my relationship with God. I have to forgive. The Bible is very clear that we're supposed to to forgive. It also means I may have to love you from, from a distance. And that could be for any number of, of reasons, but the forgiveness brings freedom to, to both well, all parties involved. Yeah. And I had to learn how to forgive myself because I was so guilty. And well, you experienced Catholic school, but I mean, I was, I was breathing and I, I felt like I was doing something wrong growing up. It's always guilty. And, and I don't have, and I was always sorry. And, and I, I always thought I was sorry because I was always doing something wrong because I was drinking, but I was just, I was just programmed that I was just always, and it was that pe- people pleasing, that emotional pleasing that I was trying to do, fix everybody. But that was never my role. It's the Lord's role, right? So once I started taking myself out of there, well, actually God just started taking myself out in stages that's when I started uh, forgiving myself and I don't have that guilt or, or feeling that that sorry anymore. What would you say to someone who is is battling with addiction or who has overcome addiction? What what advice would you would you give to them just based off your testimony, your personal experience? With that, I, I there's different seasons and of uh, well, there's addiction and but there's recovery and sobriety, right? Like sobriety, you and I are sober right now, right? Like we're not drinking our, we don't have alcohol in our coffee cups, right? We're sober, right? But that recovery state, that's where that's new. It's the new strength. It's the new mindset. So you're the one that has to make that choice of, do you want to be new? Do you want to be better? And what happens is that it's incorporated. Obviously it's the Lord that's going to help you with that. But if there, if someone is listening and they're like, you know what, I am, I'm mourning that I can't drink, or I think I do uh, need help. It is that support system that is crucial to get into a support system that other people have gone before you and they know how to come alongside you. We did an episode on, on new year's day with Michelle Fouster. We talked about the put off and put on in Ephesians, Ephesians 4, 20 through 26. So when I put off drinking and doing drugs, I couldn't just put on television, for example. I had to put on something that was going to be life-giving, something that was going to fill up my cup in the Lord. So I put on going to church, and these are all things the Holy Spirit started bringing alive in me. It wasn't me that did it. It was the Spirit that came alive in me that did it once I accepted Christ as as my Lord and Savior. But it was getting around brothers and sisters in the kingdom who were walking in, in that direction people who, and started spending my time doing different things. I I think I shared this with you when we talked on the phone, I lost about 115 pounds. So instead of doing the drugs, I would go to the gym to, to work out. So there's another hour or two there going to small groups, going again, serving in the church, I actually getting out and being the, the church, those things I had to occupy my hands to do different things. So that time didn't just go idle. So I wouldn't start meditating on what was comfortable and familiar. Yeah. Yeah, I when I well I was 25 and and the Lord blessed me with my sobriety before I had children and a husband because I always say like the real my real heroes are the moms out there who are trying to get sober with their kids because I only had to worry about myself right I only had to, I was I was able to be selfish and put myself first and a lot of and I say selfish but I was I I was able to put my sobriety priority and what you is it's hard to do when you're managing a family and raising a family but there is that that support system getting involved in service absolutely and then the other thing though too when it comes to the recovery aspect Hey, I got addicted to other things in my recovery. Uh, hey, I mean, 10 years in my sobriety, I was I became a workaholic. The Lord did some incredible work on me and I had to put boundaries in place and I burn out and I, I share this story about the hustle culture and getting involved chasing those promotions and those the paychecks and I got so caught up in it probably 10 years in recovery. And I, I knew I was starting to really have a relationship with the Lord at that time. And my family, God's family alignment was all out of whack. So I was put in work before my husband, I was put in work before my children, because I thought I was providing, I was believing the lie. But 
the enemy knows I'm, I'm an addict. So he'll come for you any which way. It wasn't a substance. It was money. Right. So like I was chasing, I was chasing something just as much as I was chasing the substance. And so I think, I think in that season of recovery is just being completely honest and having that inventory. But I'll tell you, Eric, the day that I broke down, I'll never forget where I was and where I was. And I broke down to my husband and he was holding me and I just started crying. I go, I can't do this anymore with the hustle. And I felt as if I was walking into rehab for the first time. Wow. Wow. And it was that helpless, that hopeless, that how am I going to do this? I had to make an amends to my family now because I was going to work all that stuff. So God gave me another recovery process, 10 years of sobriety in, right? So I think walking with the Lord, recovery is an everyday thing. The overlap in our testimonies is is crazy just between our families, our the the background that we had, the, the testimonies that we have. But... <laughs> That's something else you and I didn't talk about because I got caught up in that too. I actually, I took, I was, this was, there was some ignorance to this too, because I was new in the Lord, but I took a job for title and money when I was, I think I was 26 years old at that point, because being a director of development at that age was, that's really young to have that, that position. I said, man, I'll be able to do this, 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 and this, and I'll be able to provide here, 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 and I'll be able to take care of my family here, here, and here. And there's no place to go, but up in that corporate ladder. And then I had a, a wise man of God tell me, he's like, I hear everything that you're saying, but he said, you stepped on God's toes because it's his job to provide for your family. It's not you. You know, and I was really young in the Lord at that point. So this was like, I got away with not knowing any better, so to speak, but I still pay. Ignorance is not an excuse when it comes to gospel. I refuse to promote that, but I, I paid for it. I was burned out after three months of being at that job because it was a one person fundraising shop. And anyone out there who actually does fundraising, those one person fundraising shops means you do everything. And everything is usually the job of six to 14 people, <laughs> depending yeah. on where you are. So I hear you. It is. We definitely have to literally rest in the Lord and follow Jesus' example when it comes to living for him and living from him. Yeah. But isn't it crazy though, Eric? Like the enemy knew like, okay, like Eric's sober now, but but I'm going to give him this to chase. I mean, it's it's like unreal. Like, I mean, it just, it, God, God was so good to me in that season, but it, I have to tell you how painful it was when God asked me to just shut down my business. I was, I had a, I was doing my own business and, he just, and I said, God, don't you know how much money I'm making? I, I've never made so much money in my life. And he goes, that was my money, not yours. And I was like, oh. I was like, but, 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 and he was like, no. And I've never scaled that far again, but I keep telling God I'll scale and I'll be a good steward this time. I promise. Like I, I heard you loud and clear last time. <laughs> I got it. I learned from my lesson, but yeah, I, it was, I, I was just doing it all wrong. I was doing it all messy without him, without him, just inviting him into my business, invite him into all the other stuff, right? But not my work. I've, I've learned the hard way. I need you to tell me what the plan is. If you know the end from the beginning and you woke me up today, so you have a plan and purpose for my life today. Yeah. Therefore, if you see fit to wake me up tomorrow, you have a plan and purpose for my life tomorrow. But I'm only going to worry about today because today is going to have his own worries, his own issues. But in the back of my head, I'm telling myself, God, you are the only person who's been in my tomorrow. So you're the only person wow. who know what I need when I'm going when I get there. So what's the plan? What do you want me to invest in? I'm inviting you in now. I'm inviting you in on the front end. I need you to guide my steps. And this is why I encourage people to pray, but be cautious when you pray. Holy Spirit, please interrupt my day. Yeah. I'm praying for divine appointments because that divine appointment might be an interruption to Eric Stevens' plan. Yeah. So God, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna ask you to bless my plans. I am, and I'm using this as a simple example. Here, I plan on reading 12 books, 2024. Yeah. Okay. Well, here's the first six I have lined up. God, if you have some other things you want me to read and study, bring them my way. If you want me to read 14 books bring those. I'm totally just using that as a very basic example. I'm inviting you in on the front end of my plans, but that reading 12 books this year, that was discussed with him in 2023. <laughs> yeah, This is, this is the plan I'm laying out to feed myself spiritually. God, I'm laying at your feet. What are we going to do in this year? 
It's so good. It's so good. And those interruptions and I think those pivots throughout the day, we could take them a little bit easier. They're not like a, a kick below the belt, right? We're like, okay, got it. I, I got it. I'm okay. And it gives us permission to just that flexibility because we're listening to him, right? It's so good. Funny. And they can be, and like you said, they're not always gut punches. Sometimes it's, mm-hmm. I have a, a membership to the YMCA here and I have a membership to Anytime Fitness here because of my travel schedule. It just, sometimes it just works out better for me to, I have a gym that's open 24 hours. And I literally heard the spirit just gently just tell me like, go to the Anytime Fitness today. Just go there today. Yeah. And I'm like, all right. It's just, and it, it was a simple, inter- all right, sure. I'll go. Ended up praying for a gentleman there. He had just, I had no intention, obviously, of running into the guy. End up praying for him because he had something wrong with his shoulder or his elbow. I ended up praying for him. I just want to pray. You mind if I pray for you? Because he, he's not a church goer. I don't necessarily know if he's a believer or not. I don't think so, just based off our conversation. But I don't know what God's doing in this individual's heart. Prayed for him. Saw him again a couple of weeks later. He goes, man, I don't know what you did. But he's like, my arm's been feeling better ever since. And I'm like, mm. I, I didn't do anything. I wasn't even planning on coming that day. <laughs> I was going somewhere <laughs> else. So... You just don't know how God may work, but he gives me a chance. Let me invite you to church. Let me tell you about this thing we have going on here. Let me talk to you about Jesus. All of the, it just opens the door for, for so many other conversations, that level of obedience. Yeah, it's so good. So the Lord, talk about the level of obedience and the, and the Lord asked me to, or he told me to, no, he didn't ask me. He was probably asking me kindly for so long. And then he actually told me to shut down this business that I had. And he, I'll never forget. He said to, I heard not, but in my, in my, in the spirit, he said, Megan, I gave you experiences that you're not using, you're not using and you're wasting. And I was like, and I, I jumped out of the chair in my devotional and I ran to my husband was shaving. And I was like, I said to my husband, I go, I, I know what I need to be doing now. I know that I need to be serving people in a way that I need to use my experiences and my pain and my experience of strength and hope to pour into others. And that's when God shifted my business and it, he, I allowed him in and now I serve people in a different capacity, but it, I'm blessed tremendously because I get to see the transformation and the breakthroughs of the clients that I have now. And, but it was obedience and it was a hard, it was a hard decision for me to shut down and listen. And in that season, Eric, I have to say it was the quietest season of my life because just like how you asked me in recovery, did I have my circles have to change? In business, my circles had to change mm. because I'm in business. I'm in business with these people, and now I don't have that business. So all the relationships that I thought they were true relationships, and now this is me. This is Megan Devito with her own stuff. I love real hard because I, I always love real hard because I try to make up for what I didn't have, right? So all these relationships, they were emotional relationships for me, not just business. But when the business closed, I lost all that. So it was a, it was a season of just complete quietness and stillness. And, and, and that was nine years ago. And I had to get really, really good at listening to the Lord at that point. And I want to be clear too, because that level of obedience that we're talking about, like, I pray, God, I need the grace to be obedient to you. I, I can't even do that on my own. I can't even be obedient to you on my own. Mm-hmm. I hear the nudging of the Holy Spirit, but I need the grace to then do what I'm told to. I need the grace to either stay at that job or walk away from that business or start the podcast or or minister to this person. I need the grace to be able to do those things. So and so it's that obedience is nothing that either one of us are claiming that we have or we've done on our own. We are giving that fully to the Holy Spirit. So giving God fully credit for that. So yeah. I know I don't have you for much longer, but I want to, because we call you coach Megan. So I want you to explain exactly what it is that you're, you're doing now. If anyone is looking to, to partner with you, work with you, get coached by you, just talk about kind of what you're doing before we get to to our final segment. So I want to give you some time to, to share that. Oh, thank you for that opportunity, Eric. Well, what I do, what is God has given me is the ability to Come along clients, I guide them to peace rather than pressure and a life of significance rather than success. And kind of, I'm a boundaries coach and I love being able to align people with the right boundaries that they need in their life and their business, their, their family life, their home life. 
And I come alongside them and one-on-one coaching. And it just, it's a, a tremendous opportunity for someone to change their life in six months. And I get to be a part of it. So it's a, it's an honor for me to do that. So that's what I do now. And it really is just helping people step into their God-given purpose and have a bold impact for the kingdom. Are you currently taking new clients and do you take clients online? Uh, yeah. So I only take clients online. And I am currently am taking new clients. Yes, I am. Okay. And what is that process like if someone does want to work with you? Yeah. So first, I just want to make sure we're a right fit. So I encourage anyone just to get on my website and, and a book a free session with me. And kind of, I want, I want you to hear my heart. I want to pray with you. I want to just make sure that we are the right fit. And then if I am, I have the privilege of coming alongside somebody, then we work together. Um, for a minimum of six months. And I say that is because that's when that's when the sweet spot of the change really happens. And we work together on biweekly sessions and they have me in their back pocket. I'm their, I'm their life coach. So they have me for all areas of their life. And, and, and that's what we do. And we put personalized plans together with a biblical foundation. We are going to share all of your links. So if anybody would like to, to work with you or get in touch, we're going to make it as easy as possible for them. I could sit here and talk to you all day. I don't believe how fast this time has flown by. Mm -hmm. We will have to get you back on here because I think there's a few scriptures that you and I could probably break down and, and talk about. So we'll have to get you scattered again to come back on the show. This brings me to the final segment of the Rooted in Christ podcast. This is our let them know segment. This is where you can share anything that you would like with the audience. So Megan, please let them know. Let them know. I would let um, the audience know that uh, boundaries are a lifesaver. And if there's any um, boundaries in your life that's questionable, that your foundation is kind of wonky, um, I ask you to just take a, uh, an evaluation of them because those boundaries are just not for you. They're for your legacy that you are building. So good. Your boundaries are for the legacy that you're building. Oh, I might use that. I think I'm going to. <laughs> I'll, give, I'll give you credit the first five times I use it. <laughs> Okay. After that, after that, it'll be mine. <laughs> it's all yours. Thank you. Would you mind closing this out in prayer before we? Uh, oh, end day? my gosh. It would be an honor. Oh, gosh. Thank you. Father God, I want to thank you for this opportunity just to have a, a voice on this platform. God, I want to thank you for technology so we can just glorify you throughout the world. Lord, I want to thank you for Eric and his obedience to step up and host uh, a podcast in his busy schedule, Lord. and and just, I, I want to thank you for every listener that's listening to this, Lord. And if anyone is suffering with addiction or breaking generational cycles or unfortunately having a break family relationships, Lord, know that there is hope and that their Heavenly Father loves them unconditionally. And He is right there beside them, hugging them, walking them through this and holding their hand. Lord, I want to thank you for today. I want to ask you to bless um, Eric and his audience. And we thank you in your living name, Jesus. Amen. Father, I just want to thank you for everyone who has tuned in this week. Lord, I just want to thank you for the stirring that is currently taking place in their hearts. I thank you for just stirring up each one of the people who are listening to this this podcast, Lord, because we don't do this for for our our glory. We are our, 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 our uh, platform, Father. We do this for, for you, Lord. So I just thank you. Thank you for everything you're doing in my life, in, in Megan's life, Lord, in the lives of the listeners, Father. I thank you for just stirring up each one of us now, Lord. I thank you for the books that are going to get written, the the, yes. the people who are going to continue to dream, the businesses that are about to 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 start, the 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 coffee shops that'll open, the gyms that'll that'll open, the daycares that are about to open, Father. I just thank you right now for what you're just stirring people up to do mm. in this, in their inner self, Lord. Father, I just thank you for Megan. I thank you for her transparency. I thank you for just that she's just been uh, light and salt to to so many. I thank you for the expanded territory you're about to bring to to her, Father. I pray you just continue to just open up doors for for her and her family, Lord. Lord, as, as we get ready to depart, I pray your traveling mercies over each one of us. And I just thank you for giving us the opportunity just to uplift and glorify you. We just pray and ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much for being on the show. If you are out there listening, you are enjoying our content, please like, follow, share, and subscribe. It really goes a long way to helping us get the message out and get the word out about Jesus. Megan, we will have to get you back on in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.